theistic evolution, or what has been called evolutionary creationism, is the view that God created everything, from molecules to modern people, through completely natural processes. Theistic evolutionist Francisco Ayala writes this, Living beings can be explained as the result of a natural process, natural selection, without any need to resort to a creator or other external agent. Likewise, Francis Collins writes this, Once evolution got underway, no special supernatural intervention was required. According to theistic evolution, the Bible uses language that allows for God to create humans through a natural process. For instance, Genesis 1 states that God made, and here it uses the Hebrew term azah. He made the first humans. And that God formed, and again the Hebrew term is yetzar. He formed Adam from the dust of the ground. Genesis 2.7 now, does this refer to a de novo creation of humans? De novo comes from the Latin, which means from the new. Well, maybe and maybe not. The Bible uses the same terms to describe how God made Azah, Job, in his mother's womb and how God formed Yetzar, the nation of Israel, from the womb. Think about when we were in our mother's womb, when God, to use Psalm 139, when God knit us together fearfully and wonderfully. I have yet to meet a religious individual who believes that God comes out of heaven and interventionistically, that is, dramatically, attaches an arm, a leg, or a nose. Rather, we see ourselves being created by God through natural embryological processes. Now, while we commonly refer to the miracle of birth, Christians don't really consider human fetal development to be a divine intervention. The study of embryology shows that natural processes are at work. Furthermore, Genesis uses the same term to describe how God made Azah, the stars, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 16. So are we really to believe that star formation is a direct intervention of God? Modern astronomy teaches that stars form when gravity pulls matter and gas together, forming a heated core. This is a natural process, not a supernatural one. Theistic evolutionists also argue that the Bible depicts God as the ultimate cause behind natural events. They argue that the Hebrews didn't distinguish between primary and secondary causes. So, they point out, according to the Bible, God causes or creates the rain and the mist, the snow, the growth of grass, the lightning during a rainstorm, the clouds and the wind. Surely, we don't believe that God supernaturally intervenes every time that we see snow or watch the grass grow. And from this, theistic evolution contends that God also uses natural processes to create life on Earth, and in fact, even the first humans. From this perspective, we are not depreciating God's creation, but merely describing God's creation. What are we to think of theistic evolution? Well, it seems to me that we should critically evaluate this perspective, and in my estimation, this has numerous problems, many of which are just simply insuperable to integrate with the biblical text. Theistic evolution claims to know that God never intervened into his own creation. Now, upon reflection, this is truly a spectacular claim. 
You know, theistic evolution doesn't merely claim that God installed natural processes to create differing forms of life, which is a view that every Christian should affirm. Instead, theistic evolution claims to know that God never intervened to form or create any form of life on earth. Now, we have to ask the question, how could they possibly know this? Now, we agree that Christians have overzealously claimed miraculous interventions in the past, discovering you know, much later that natural processes could have easily accounted for these phenomena. And as Christians, we should remain cautious, in my opinion, in claiming to know how and when and where God specially intervened to create life. However, theistic evolution rejects a moderate view like this. It actually claims to know that God never intervened in the creation of life on earth over a period of 3.8 billion years. Again, how could they possibly know this? This would essentially require omniscience or being all-knowing to support such a remarkable and exhaustive claim. The God of the Bible isn't confined to some kind of a naturalistic cage. Nothing handcuffs him from entering his own universe. From what we know about the God of the Bible, we should never make such a dogmatic claim such as this. After all, theistic evolution would affirm the resurrection of Jesus, as well as many of the miracles that he performed. For instance, Francis Collins writes this, If Christ really was the Son of God, as he explicitly claimed, then surely, of all those who have ever walked the earth, he could suspend the laws of nature if he needed to do so to achieve a more important purpose. Now, does this statement bother anybody else? Why is it that he would allow God the Son to perform miracles? and supernatural interventions, while not allowing God the Father to perform them. To put this another way, how long would it take for us to discover the natural explanation for Jesus' resurrection? Now, to a biblically trained mind, this question is nothing short of absurd. There simply is no natural explanation. Of course, deists, naturalists, or atheists would have no problem denying the resurrection of Jesus, or any other miracle for that matter. Fair enough. But how absurd is it for a Christian theist to hold to such a view? Theistic evolution is also often guilty of double talk. It's one thing to say that God used natural laws to create stars, but it's quite another thing to say that he used natural selection acting on random mutation to create humans. After all, according to Kenneth Miller, there has never been any kind of plan to evolution because evolution works without either plan or purpose. Evolution is random and undirected. So I hope you can see the, the difficulty here. How is it that we could say that God purposefully planned to create humans through a process that contains neither a plan nor a purpose? Some theistic evolutionists argue that God may have manipulated the mutations to create humans. And sure, that's possible. But then this no longer fits with any known definition of evolution. We cannot, therefore, continue to call this natural selection acting upon random mutation. Instead, we would need to call this supernatural guidance of designed mutations. Now, if a theistic evolutionist were to double down and claim that God designed humans purely through natural mutations, random mutations, then this is surely nonsense. It's like saying that a person cheated in a game of poker by stacking the deck of cards when he randomly shuffled them. Now, surely this is absurd. Either he stacked the deck, which would be design, or he randomly shuffled the deck, which would be random mutation. It can be one or the other, 
but it cannot be both. Giberson and Collins appear to see the ramifications of this. They write this, The process of evolution is driven in large part by random mutations. So, it certainly seems possible that Earth could have been home to an entirely different assortment of creatures. Without a creator who is all-knowing and who knows the future, we would have to agree with this sentiment. Another example of double talk comes from Kenneth Miller, who is a Roman Catholic biologist from Brown University. In one book, he writes this, Mankind's appearance on this planet was not preordained. We are an afterthought, a minor detail, a happenstance in a history that might just as well have left us out. Yet, in another book, he writes this, People of faith know that ours is a universe willed by God, and that our presence within it is part of his plan and purpose. Now, these two statements contradict each other. Is he himself confused, or is the position itself confused, or perhaps both? This just seems to me to be guilty of double talk. Either it was planned or it was unplanned. Either it was random or it was designed, but it can't be both at the same time. Theistic evolution detracts from natural theology. What is natural theology? Well, to illustrate this, when we look at an oil painting, we can recognize certain necessary characteristics of the artist who created it. Of course, we cannot know everything about the artist. We don't know the artist's age or gender or favorite flavor of ice cream. Yet we do know some things. The artist is personal, the artist is intentional, and the artist is creative. Similarly, the Bible teaches that God has revealed some of his characteristics through the created world. In other words, we can learn about the Creator by looking at his creation. Paul writes this in Romans 1.20. He says, Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. Paul states that this is so evident that people are without excuse. He asserts that people actually come to understand something about God's existence and nature through the physical universe, the creation of the world, through what has been made. Paul even draws his choice of words from Genesis chapter 1, where we read of all that God has made, Genesis 1.31, in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. This is the same language that Paul uses when he refers to what has been made. To state this succinctly, God's invisible nature can be seen through his visible creation. However, theistic evolution has major problems at this point because it contends that God worked invisibly in his creation of the world through unguided natural processes. How then can God's nature be evident, as Paul says, to the point that all people on earth are without excuse? Theistic evolution cannot adequately interpret Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Now that's a bold claim, but let me demonstrate the reasons why. Some theistic evolutionists are so bold and brazen that they actually just outright deny the historicity of Adam and Eve. For instance, Dennis Lamoureux writes this, Did the Apostle Paul believe that Adam was a real person? Yes, well of course he did. Paul was a first century A.D. Jew, and like every Jewish person around him, he accepted the historicity of Adam. It is understandable why most Christians believe that Adam was a real historical person. This is exactly what Scripture states in both the Old and New Testaments. And yet, Lamoureux simply thinks that this was false. Elsewhere, he writes this, Holy Scripture makes statements about God creating living organisms that, in fact, never happened. He writes, Adam never existed. Well, we appreciate him being so forthright with his view. 
Others are not so bold. They claim that God breathed a spiritual component into perhaps two relatively evolved humanoid primates, thus making the first human image bearers by giving them Adam souls. Adam and Eve were leaders of their tribe that represented the larger group. And maybe it even had a covenant nature to it. That's not explicit in scripture, but we see that pattern in how God related to Noah and Abraham and David. He makes a covenant with a leader, but then that becomes affects all of their descendants and a whole group of people. So perhaps Adam and Eve's choice to sin was something that they did that impacted everyone else around them. Now this is an interesting you theoretical speculation. About. Perhaps God could have evolved humans in this way and then given them a soul. But does it fit with divine revelation on the subject? So it's good speculation, but does it fit with revelation from Scripture? Genesis simply doesn't use this language. Genesis does use the language of God appearing to individual people. For instance, we read that the Lord appeared to Abram selecting him out from among many other humans alive at his time. God also appeared to Moses, selecting him from the other Hebrews in Exodus chapter 3. However, this is not the language of Genesis 1 and 2. The early humans weren't separated from God and then called into a relationship with him. Instead, humans were created into a relationship with God and freely separated from him. This misreads the text so drastically that this is the message of Genesis 3, not Genesis 1 and 2. Theistic evolution diminishes the New Testament understanding of Adam and Eve's historicity. Theistic evolutionists have enough problems with interpreting Genesis, but they have insuperable problems once they get to the New Testament. As you read through these various passages, notice that the authors never give an argument or an apologetic for Adam and Eve. Why not? Well, because both they and their audiences assumed that they were historical people. Consider Jesus' statement here in Matthew chapter 19. Jesus said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And he said, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Jesus ties Genesis 1.27 together with Genesis 2.24. He cites both of these passages. The language of for this reason or therefore in this text actually points us back to how Eve was created from Adam's side. Jesus also bases his ethical view of marriage on God's historical design. We may draw wisdom from, you know, parables and fables, but we don't derive ethics from them. We would never have moral authority, for example, to counsel a person against divorce by citing the story of the tortoise and the hare. Furthermore, Jesus later states in verse 8, From the beginning it has not been this way. We are currently in a post-fall environment, where divorce just rips relationships to ribbons. However, Jesus states that God created marriage in a pre-fall environment, where it was not this way. Now, in response to this, Dennis Lemereau says this, Jesus was accommodating to the Jewish belief of the day that Adam was a real person. Now here we need to pause and ask a very simple question. Was Jesus accommodating to ancient people or is Dennis Lemereau accommodating to modern people? For those who are acquainted with the character of Jesus, we simply cannot take this claim seriously. Even in this very passage, Jesus fiercely opposes the accommodating religious consensus regarding the position of any matter divorce, which, incidentally, is the exact opposite of what Lamoureux accuses him of doing. Jesus never accommodated to false beliefs. 
He chased the religious swindlers out of the temple in John 2. He called his Jewish interlocutors blind guides and vipers and snakes in Matthew 23. He rejected the Sadducean denial of the resurrection in Matthew 22. Over and over and over again, Jesus corrected the leading teachers of his day for their understanding of Scripture, but he never corrected them over the inspiration of Scripture. Moreover, this perspective raises a theological problem. If Jesus accommodated to false beliefs, then does this mean that this gives us authorization to accommodate to falsehood as well? If we are supposed to be imitators of God, as Ephesians 5.1 teaches, should we imitate him by accommodating falsehood? What about Jesus' genealogy in Luke chapter 3, verse 38? Think about this. The son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Here Luke traces Jesus' human ancestry all the way back to Adam. And in this genealogy, everyone on the list has a human father. Except who? Except Adam. He's actually called the Son of God in this text. We see the same approach in Old Testament genealogies, such as 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 1, where it just simply begins with Adam. There's no antecedent or previous human ancestor. Now, much like Dennis Lamoureux, John Walton thinks that God was accommodating to the ancient view in Luke chapter 3. He asks this, if God was simply using their contemporary concepts as a framework for communication. However, surely you can see that this is mistaken. God wasn't using their first century religious concepts. He was using his own words revealed in the early chapters of Genesis. Furthermore, this argument doesn't work for Luke because he was a Gentile Christian writing primarily to other Gentiles. So, if anyone would have been likely to break away from the historical contents of the Old Testament, it would be a Gentile, like Luke, except he is the one who expressly teaches that humanity came from Adam. Think, too, of Paul's statement in Acts chapter 17, verse 26. Paul says, God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. John Walton understands the one man in Paul's statement to refer to Noah and the nations. Well, this is mistaken if we simply stop to count the number of people on the ark. One man did not populate the earth after Noah's flood. Eight people did. Paul is surely referring to Adam for a number of reasons. First, grammatically, the Greek literally states from one, hex henos, which is in the masculine singular. This fits with Romans chapter 5, where Paul refers to Adam as the one man. Second, linguistically, the expression on all the face of the earth that Paul uses reflects God's commission to be fruitful and fill the earth in Genesis 1.28. Third, contextually, the previous verse refers to how God himself gives to all people life and breath and all things, which parallels Genesis 2-7, that the Lord breathed into Adam his soul. Fourth and finally, Paul theologically parallels the one man with the man, capital M, Jesus Christ, who rose from the dead in verse 31 of Acts 17. F.F. Bruce has this to say. He says, The Athenians prided themselves in being autochthones, sprung from the soil of their native Attica. The Greeks in general considered themselves superior to non-Greeks, whom they called barbarians. Against such claims of radical superiority, Paul asserts the unity of all men. This makes sense of Acts 17, 30-31, which refers to universal judgment or universal salvation for the universal human race. 
Romans chapter 5 is also an incredibly difficult passage for theistic evolution. It is never intended as an absolute literal description of a literal couple, that this is an allegory, that this is a story that is representative of who we are. We are all Adam, we are all Eve. People are troubled by that because certainly St. Paul seems to, in the New Testament, refer to Adam as a real person. And so do you say St. Paul was mistaken? That bothers people quite a bit. Dennis Venema and Scott McKnight believe that Paul is not referring to a literal Adam, but a literary Adam. They claim that the Adam and Eve of the Bible are a literary Adam and Eve. Later, they write this. Each person is Adamic in that each person sins in the way Adam sinned. According to them, Romans chapter 5 and 1 Corinthians 15 refer to Adam as a literary archetype or prototype or every man for everyone's sin. Thus, they write this, Adam and Eve are paradigms of the condition of each and every one human being. Faced with the demand of God, each human in history chooses to disobey and therefore dies. Yet, this simply doesn't fit with Romans chapter 5. For one, Paul states that sin entered the world through Adam. He writes that through one man, sin entered the world in verse 12. Now, obviously, myths do not create sin, suffering, and death. Only men do. Since the focus of Romans 5 is on humans, this means that human sin did not exist until Adam brought it into the world. So, too, Paul places Adam on the same historical ground as Jesus and Moses. Adam, in verse 14, is called the one man, and he's called that throughout the section. Verse 12, verse 15, verse 16, verse 17, verse 19, just as Jesus is called the one man in verses 15, 17, and 19 of Romans chapter 5. Paul also states that death reigned from Adam until Moses in verse 14, seeing no historical difference between the two persons. Paul also calls Adam a type of Christ. This means that Adam foreshadowed or prefigured Jesus in some way. It is impossible for Adam to prefigure Jesus if he never existed. So, in a sense, this would reduce what the Bible teaches about original sin. What the text is not saying here is that we sin in the same way that Adam sinned. Instead, the use of the aorist implies that we sinned in Adam, which is the consistent theme throughout Romans 5-8. through what about 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 8 and 9? For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. This language of woman from man refers back to Genesis 2.21 to 23, where Eve was created from Adam. And woman for the man's sake refers to Genesis 2.18, where Eve, in a corresponding and complementary way, corresponds to Adam. Nothing in this text even hints at the thought that Paul is merely making a literary allusion to these figures. He seems to assume that his audience already accepts the historical reality of Adam and Eve. He doesn't even feel the need to name them or elaborate extensively. So it seems to me that Paul assumes that even these pagan Corinthians knew of the first human primitive pair. Paul also writes 1 Corinthians 15, 21. Here we read, For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. This text doesn't refer to spiritual death because the context of 1 Corinthians 15 revolves around our physical resurrection. In fact, in this passage, death is parallel to the resurrection of the dead. Instead, this is referring to the physical death of Adam and how it will be solved by the physical 
resurrection of Jesus. That's just the context of 1 Corinthians 15. So the past spread of physical death is historically equivalent to the future resurrection of physical life through Christ. As we jump down in 1 Corinthians 15 to verse 44, we read this. Our bodies, they are sown a natural body, but it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. That's a citation of Genesis 2.7. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we also will bear the image of the heavenly. Now here we see that Paul cites from Genesis 2.6 that the first man, Adam, became a living soul, and he even makes an allusion to the image of God, the image of the earthy, which would allude back to Genesis 127. Um, another alternative is that this was never intended to be a couple that was there all by themselves, but actually a specific couple chosen by God in some Neolithic kind of community that was the first couple to receive this knowledge of good and evil and this sense of the spiritual and from whom all of us in certain ways then... Paul believed that Adam was, quote, the first man. There were not thousands of humans who existed before him. Humans received the image of God from Adam, verse 49, not from other pre-Adamic humans or hominins. Jesus is second, verse 47, and the last, verse 45. But this doesn't mean that Jesus was the last human being to be born, any more than it means that he was the second human being to be born. Of course, this refers to our identification with Adam or with Christ, what theologians refer to as federal headship, or what some call corporate personality. There will be no universal representative for salvation after Jesus, just as there was no universal representative for sin before Adam. 2 Corinthians 11.3 says this, I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds, noemata, will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. And then in verse 13, we pick up, For such men are false prophets, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also distinguish themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. Now, as we look at this passage, let's start with the clear before moving to the less clear or unclear. Paul clearly understands Satan to be real. Earlier in 1 Corinthians, he wrote that Satan targets the minds, and here he uses the same term, noemata, of people. This is in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, where he blinds the minds of the unbelieving. Also in 2 Corinthians 2.11, that Satan has certain schemes, and in chapter 10, verse 5. And Paul here is pointing out that he's worried that these false teachers will also deceive the minds, noemata, of the Corinthians. Later in the same chapter, Paul connects Satan with these very real false teachers. But does Paul understand the serpent to be the same as Satan? Yes, yes, he does. Notice the parallels between how the serpent deceived Eve and how the false teachers are deceitful workers in verse 13. So too, notice how Eve fell from innocence in the garden and how Paul was worried that the Corinthians would fall away from simplicity and purity. Later, Paul explicitly connects the serpent and the deceitful workers with Satan in verse 14. Is it just a coincidence 
that Paul mentions the serpent and Satan in the same context of false teachers, as though one were merely a literary illusion while the other was a literal reality? This just seems to stretch our credulity. Hebrews chapter 11, here we read of the great hall of faith. We read about the worlds which were prepared by the word of God, of Abel, of Cain, of Enoch, of Noah, and then of Abraham. Why is it that the author of the Hebrews lists an assortment of Old Testament figures? His main thrust here is just to show that without faith, it is impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Verse 6. Now, the author of Hebrews lists these people in chapter 11 because they, quote, gained approval by their faith in verse 2. And notice he lists creation, Abel, Cain, Enoch, Noah. Notice the author doesn't see any discontinuity between the people of Genesis 1 through 11 and those which follow. The author moves seamlessly into the life of Abraham and way beyond. And then he concludes by saying this, these were all commended for their faith in verse 39. And then he says that he expects them to, quote, be made perfect in verse 40. In other words, the author of Hebrews is saying that we will see these people in heaven. What about 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13 and 14? There we read, it was Adam who was first created and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Traditional interpreters understand that Paul is citing Genesis here to make a theological case against women Bible teachers. That's besides the point for our purposes here. Regardless, what Paul is doing here is contradicting the Gnostic false teaching, false teaching at the time, that taught how Eve was created first, and which also taught that Eve was not deceived. So Paul is correcting this view by citing both Genesis 2, it was Adam who was first created, and Genesis 3, the woman being deceived fell into transgression. If Paul viewed these texts as myths or fables, then why did he go through the trouble of correcting these false teachers at this time? Theistic evolution also denies that Adam and Eve were the sole progenitors of the human race. Evolution obviously doesn't just produce a pair of organisms. It produces an entire species, right? Therefore, theistic evolutionists currently assert that the human population reached some kind of a bottleneck of roughly 10,000 people, but certainly not two people. So, in their view, Adam, if he existed at all, was the federal head of the whole of humanity which was alive at that time. Is this true? This has major discord with the text of Genesis. Let me give you a few examples. For one, it is only after God created humans that he tells them to be fruitful and multiply and to fill the earth. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. If humans existed in a large population of, say, 10,000, this command would be meaningless, for they were already procreating like bunnies and spreading across the earth. Second, Genesis states there was no man to cultivate the ground in Genesis 2.5. Now, the Hebrew of this text uses the negative particle, which is a particle of non-existence, no man. Of course, it's possible that this could simply refer to the garden, that there was no man who existed in this location. In fact, in our view, this is actually pretty likely. The difficulty for theistic evolution, however, is that God doesn't plant the garden until Genesis 2.8, a couple verses later, which is after he creates the first humans. Third, Genesis states in chapter 2, verse 7, Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground. Now, the text doesn't say that the first human 
came from hominin parents. It says that he came from the dust of the ground. Now, some might say this is metaphorical, but that's really hard to believe because later we read in verse 19 of chapter 3, you will return to the ground because from it you were taken, for you are dust and to dust you shall return. This is the same language as Genesis 2.7. It uses the word Adamah, ground, and dust. So if the dust of the ground is actually metaphorical for some kind of previous primates that existed, you know, before or during the time of the first primitive pair, then what does it mean that these first humans would return to the dust of the ground? This just refers to dying, decaying in the earth. Fourth, Adam was alone, according to Genesis 2.18, and he could find no suitable helper, according to Genesis 2.20. Now, how does this fit with the theory that there were thousands of other Homo sapiens alive at this time? Why didn't God imbue a soul into one of the other 5,000 women, just like he did, according to theistic evolutionists, with Adam? Fifth, Eve is called the mother of all the living in Genesis 3.20. Now, surely this refers to being the progenitor of all human beings because plants and animals already pre-existed humans. So how can she be the mother of all the living, all living humans, if there are 10,000 humans who preceded her? Sixth, we see no mention of any human parents for Adam. We see this nowhere in the Bible. Instead, we read this. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female, and he blessed them and named them man in the day when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of his son in his own likeness. In Genesis 5, verses 1 through 3. Now notice the literary connections here that are made. There's a connection with Genesis 1.27 and Genesis 2. They were made male and female, and they were made in the likeness of God. Later, genealogies understand Adam to be the first human. First Chronicles 1, we already saw that. And Luke's genealogy gives everyone a human father except Adam. He's called simply the Son of God, Luke 3.38. Seventh, other ancient Near Eastern texts state that humans came from a group, not a single pair. The Atrahasis epoch has humanity originate with seven human pairs. The hymn of Aeon Gura has human beings break through the earth like plants springing up at the same time. And yet Genesis describes a single human pair, quite different, way different, from the surrounding ancient Near Eastern literature. Eighth, other Old Testament passages support the historicity of Adam and Eve. Hosea mentions Adam in chapter 6, verse 7. Job mentions him in chapter 31, verse 33. God's relationship with Noah harkens back to the first humans after the flood, just as his relationship with Abraham harkens back to the first humans, where he tells Abraham to be fruitful and multiply and to rule and govern the earth. The seed, Zerah, that is mentioned throughout the text of Genesis also ties the entire narrative together from chapter 315 all the way to 48 verse 4. This is the, the theme throughout the book of Genesis. And so we would do injustice to its unity to rip this text apart. On what basis then do we call these later chapters historical while these early chapters are metaphorical or even mythical? Theistic evolutionists need to perform nothing short of Olympic level interpretive gymnastics to explain these texts. But at a certain point, we need to ask ourselves a soul searching question. Are we reading scripture through the lens of theistic evolution? Or are we reading theistic evolution through the lens of Scripture? Theistic evolution doesn't account for the language of create, the Hebrew term bara, 
regarding the origin of humans. As we noted before, theistic evolution goes to great lengths to show the elastic range of the words make and form to the terms azah and yetzar to describe the creation of the first humans in the Genesis account. And to be honest, this is a fair point. However, they fail to explain the use of the Hebrew word create, the word bara, with regard to the origin of the first humans. We see this in Genesis 1, verse 27. In this particular verbal form, only God himself is the subject. What I mean is only God can create or bara something. The use of this word is especially appropriate to the concept of creation by divine fiat. While the word formed, yatsar, primarily emphasizes the shaping of an object, the term create or bara emphasizes the initiation of the object. Consider just a couple of these examples in the Hebrew Bible. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created, bara, the heavens and the earth. Exodus 34.10, I will perform miracles which have not been produced, bara, in all the earth. Number 16.30, the Lord brings about, bara, an entirely new thing. Psalm 51.10, create, bara, in me, a clean heart, O God. Psalm 104.30, you send forth your spirit, they are created, bara. This form of creation in the Hebrew Bible in this verbal form, is always supernatural, never natural. The semantic range of the words azah and yetzar might actually allow for a natural process, that's true. But the use of create, bara, seems to preclude such an interpretation. Theistic evolution cannot consistently avoid divine intervention. Theistic evolution soft pedals the idea that God intervened into the world to create life. However, as Christians, we affirm a theistic universe, not a deistic universe. We simply cannot shirk the supernatural, in other words. No matter how we interpret the early chapters of Genesis, there is a supernatural God. And so pandering to naturalistic scientism is really a failed project right from the beginning because the supernatural is unavoidable in a Christian worldview. I'll give you just two concrete examples. For one, the origin of the soul. Even if we grant the full neo-Darwinian paradigm of creation, you know, from molecules to modern humans, we still have a pesky problem. The Christian belief in an immaterial soul. Did the soul evolve? Well, of course not. Souls contain immaterial properties, not material ones. Theistic evolution does not, and in fact, it cannot account for the spiritual component of humans without resorting to divine intervention. Second, the origin of Eve. For the sake of argument, let's grant that God created the first man through an evolutionary process. But even if this was the case, what do we do with Eve? However we understand God creating Eve from Adam's rib, we surely need to affirm that the text is teaching a supernatural and special creation of God. So by holding to theistic evolution, we might gain some ground with naturalistic scientists. That's true. But we will lose that ground as soon as we start to say that Eve was a special creation. Here's the thing. Divine intervention and creation is unavoidable no matter how we look at these texts. Therefore, whatever theistic evolution gives with the right hand, it takes away with the left. Sooner or later, any naturalistic thinker is going to need to face the reality of a supernatural creator. Theistic evolution also has major difficulties with the problem of evil. Theistic evolution hopes to aid evangelism by harmonizing modern science and inspired scripture. However, the medicine is worse than the disease itself. After all, the most persistent and perennial objection that skeptics raise against God is not science, 
its suffering. This theological perspective actually would indict God for the existence of human evil in the world. God created the world without human sin and evil, calling his creation very good in Genesis 1.31. And the first humans were not ashamed, Genesis 2.25. In the traditional view, humans freely chose to violate God's loving relationship with them by deliberately choosing against him. This is the defense for the problem of evil. Yet theistic evolution effectively denies all of this. Thousands of generations of Homo sapiens existed before Adam and Eve, fighting with one another in a world red in tooth and claw. As Dennis Lamoureux has written, there is no sin-death problem. Adam never existed, and consequently, sin did not enter the world through him. Nor then did physical death arise as a divine judgment for his transgressions. Likewise, Carl Giberson writes, After many generations, selfishness was so fully programmed into our genomes that it was a significant part of what we now call human nature. Giberson also writes this, There is no original sin, and there was no original sinner. Therefore, instead of humans creating the first sin against God, God first created humans to be sinful. If God created a world of sinful creatures, then who is to blame? Think about that. While a skeptic might find theistic evolution more palatable than the other interpretations of Genesis, it won't take them very long to connect the dots here, seeing that this would truly blame God as the originator of evil. Theistic evolution leads to a slippery slope for the doctrine of biblical inerrancy. By denying key biblical teachings, theistic evolution leads us down a very slippery slope. After all, if we deny one part of scripture by the same exact logic, why not deny other parts as well? Now here we are not referring to a slippery slope fallacy. See, this is committed when the first action that you commit is morally neutral, but it could lead to later immoral behavior. No, here we are speaking about something entirely different. Theistic evolution creates a true slippery slope, not a slippery slope fallacy. Why is this a true slippery slope? This is because the first act that they commit is itself sinful. Theistic evolution creates a true slippery slope because they are denying God's word on many levels. This is not an innocuous or morally neutral act to deny the word of God. It is a sin. In fact, it is the very sin behind the serpent's question. Did God really say? This question has led to a complete landslide for the human race leading us down a sinful, slippery slope ever since. Don't believe me? Is this just some kind of theoretical question that I'm raising? Consider these quotations below. Some of these are from theistic evolutionists and others are from atheistic evolutionists. Let's play the game. Who said it? Theistic evolutionist or atheistic evolutionist? Science calls the tune and religion dances to its music. Who said it? Kenneth Miller, theistic evolutionist. Number two, Darwinism set aside God as the author of creation. And finally, the rise of biochemistry and molecular biology removed any doubt as to whether or not the properties of living beings, humanity included, could be explained in terms of physics and chemistry of ordinary matter. The word is out. We are mere molecules. Who said it? Theistic evolutionist or atheistic evolutionist? Theistic evolutionist Kenneth Miller. 
Number three, the cosmos is within us. We are made of star stuff. We are a way for the universe to know itself. Carl Sagan, atheistic evolutionist. Number four, the world has many religions, but just one science. And that tells us something about both. Theistic evolutionist, Kenneth Miller. Number five, why would an all-powerful creator decide to plant his carefully crafted species on islands and continents in exactly the appropriate pattern to suggest, irresistibly, that they had evolved and dispersed from the site of their evolution? Atheistic evolutionist, Richard Dawkins. Number six, we are survival machines. Robot vehicles blindly programmed to preserve the selfish molecules known as genes. This is a truth which still fills me with astonishment. Atheistic evolutionist, Richard Dawkins. Every event, from a thought in your head, to the chirp of a bird, to the explosion of a distant star, results from four kind of interactions that occur in nature. Gravitational, electromagnetic, strong nuclear and weak nuclear forces. Carl Giberson, theistic evolutionist. Now I hope you can see what I was getting at here. If this was a test, how many of us would be able to get any higher than a 50%? If we were being graded on this test, how many of us would have been able to pass? Well, by way of conclusion, in my estimation, theistic evolution is littered with difficulties. It has philosophical issues. It has theological issues. It has biblical issues. Anywhere you look, now, now they would argue that scientifically that this fits better. And yet, at this point, we're not trying to see how to integrate science and scripture. We're just trying to see which view is permissible by the text of scripture. And it seems to me that theistic evolution simply doesn't fit. We might compare Genesis to the foundation of a building. If you start to tweak at the foundation, the entire edifice is going to be ripped apart. We might compare Genesis to an anchor on a boat. You know, if we pull up the anchor on the boat, that boat might stay there for quite some time. You know, it might not have any reason to move. And yet, as the wind and the waves pick up, because there is no anchor for the boat, that boat will be slowly shifted out into sea. And the same is true with the book of Genesis. If we give up the truthfulness of these opening chapters, we are eroding the foundation of Christian faith. Now, what I don't mean to imply is that the issue of theistic evolution is a salvation issue. We have brothers and sisters in Christ who are true believers who believe in theistic evolution. The issue of salvation has to do with having a surrendering of the heart to Jesus, not how you view the integration of science and scripture. What I'm saying here is that as we give up the foundation in our Bible, which is the book of Genesis, this is the root from which we get so many of our doctrines about God, about creation, the fall, redemption. It all comes rooted in Genesis. As we start to mess with this, it's going to have huge, huge theological ramifications. Maybe not for us, maybe not today, or maybe not tomorrow, but just like that boat shifting slowly out into sea, is we unanchor ourselves from the foundation of Genesis. This has tremendous theological, philosophical, biblical, and indeed practical implications. Mm -hmm.